I can see it now. And welcome to another episode of the Smoke and Tobacco Show. I'm Nicole. Nope. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go I ahead. said I'm just, Nicole. Just, just keep on going with it. Just keep on going with it. Normally it's me, but... That's I, okay. Uh, I figured I'd dive in today. Um, but I am here with Matthew Tobacco and our special guest, um, Jeff from Corona Cigar Co. So welcome. Jeff. Welcome Hello. To the show. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we're really excited about this. Um, you're somebody that I've wanted to have on the show for a while. Um, you obviously have quite the presence down in Florida with Corona Cigar. Um, I've been a customer of yours before. Uh, great stuff you guys have down there. I've. It's on. It's. You're in my top. I don't even want to say top five. You're in my top three places to go when I. I have this thing when the virus is safe to travel again, I, I want to hit Florida because there's a lot going on down there. And Corona's like number two, maybe, maybe number one of like the places I want to hit in Florida when I finally get down there. So this is, this is cool for me too. Um, thank you for coming on the show. Um, we have some, we're going to talk to you about you a little bit. We're going to talk to you maybe about what you got going on at Corona for um, the holiday shopping season. I'm sure you guys are, blowing out cigars right now i'm sure you guys are doing a lot of stuff you guys i know you guys are a big company so you guys are doing probably insane sales but we'll find out what the best buys are all right <laughs> well listen when it, florida's open just to let you know florida is open for business uh people are driving down um i know a lot of people aren't wanting to fly right now but the tourism is wide open um you know so if you want to escape the cold weather up north jump in the car if people want to take a little holiday vacation Florida is OFB, open for business. <laughs> yeah, we're we're playing it safe right now, but we're hoping early next year or sometime next year, maybe we can get, you know, traveling again, uh, especially with, you know, hopefully these vaccines come out and, you know, make that more of a reality for everybody. Um, we're coming. Yeah, so we just need it to happen uh, so we can kind of get back to what we uh, had planned to, to go on this year, I would make up for next year. Um, but yeah, no, so we're, we're definitely excited to have you on. Uh, I'm smoking, for those of you guys following along at home, I'm smoking a Perdomo 20th Sun Grown Toro. Uh, Jeff, what are you smoking? I'm smoking uh, Old Faithful, the FSG. <laughs> oh, those are great. Nice, those nice. Those really are great. Um, so I used, I used to be on the ash holes radio podcast uh and my first episode i did we actually smoked that cigar and i remember i was actually like wow this is pretty good and then i remember smoking it later on after that like when i actually had time to like sit down and think about it for myself and i was like wow this is really good now those are made by drew estate correct yes yeah good stuff out of them yeah that it's uh it's my everyday it's my favorite cigar i smoke it all the time uh we have a lot of different cigars that use florida sun grown tobacco um, each one is different, especially when they're from different, uh, factories cause they're blended with totally different tobacco and we'll right. be able to go through some of those tonight, but this is a, this is a old faithful for me. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a good one. I know, uh, my shops up here have them, um, my shops, um, two guys smoke shop and I, I believe it's at twins too. Um, I thought it was there, but yeah, those are my two shops up here at home. Uh, like I said, I know I've seen them, I've had them. Uh, they're great cigars. Um, if you haven't tried them, you should try them. They're really great. And yeah, New Hampshire, uh, you, you guys have a lot of great, you know, New Hampshire, honestly, I think for the amount of people that live in that state, you guys have probably the most cigar bars and cigar shops and the best ones in the country per capita. Yeah. And plus there's no tobacco tax on cigars up here either. <laughs> I know, but I think there's something about the uh, lifestyle uh, of, of New Hampshire as well. Guys yeah. like to smoke cigars, and it, and it feels good, you know, when you're up there smoking cigars. Yeah, no, it's 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 definitely, uh, I think, did John say it? Uh, John, I think one time said it was like God's country for cigars. Um, it, it really is. It's it's the perfect storm. There's, there's some of the, the best shops are up here. There's no tax. It's There's lounges everywhere. And the, sh and the shops we do have are insane. I mean, they're... Right. Even even if you go to Kurt Kendall's place at 724 Lounge, I mean that yep. he he's got the great cigar layout, but then he's got his bar and he's really into bourbons, tequilas, yep. and the the just the 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 selection of bottles he has up in the bar. I mean they're everywhere. You walk in there and it's the whole like corner of the of the bar is all bottles, and he's got stuff in there that 
maybe you've heard of, maybe you've never heard of, stuff that's hard to get, stuff that maybe you've only ever seen once in your life. Cigar well, cigar shops and lounges up here are badass. I always tell people that, you know, people when they come visit like Corona Cigar in Florida, there's, you know, there's a lot of states you can't even do what we do. Have a cigar shop, a cigar smoking, and a cigar bar. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's certain states like New Hampshire. Um, I love the motto, live free or die. And yep. uh, the fact that they, they it's, it's a state that you can actually do that in. Because I'm not so sure, well, I mean, besides all the taxes in Massachusetts, there's other states where... If a guy wants to have a cigar bar, you can't even do it anymore. There's only one that I know of in Boston. So we're just outside of Boston. We're in a sweet – I'm in a sweet spot. Nicole's like 10 minutes outside of Boston. Yeah. But I'm like half hour north. So I'm like just outside of Boston, but I'm also 10 minutes shy of the New Hampshire border. Um, so I'm like kind of close to everything. But in Boston specifically – uh, there's only one bar lounge place, and that's going to be uh, Stanza di Cigari in the North End, in the Italian neighborhood. Yep. Other than that, I don't think there is another cigar lounge bar or anything. I think the rest of them are just straight shops. Um, yeah. So yep. Massachusetts, you got, and, and you know what the thing is with that place? It's a great place. I like going there. Um, I've been popping in and out of there for years. But it's such a tourist trap, you know what I mean? It's not the, <laughs> it's not the home lounge that you go to on Saturday night, Friday night, Wednesday afternoon. It's always going to be the same that you find in New Hampshire. It's it's not. It's the same. Like they're charging eighty dollars for a stick of Opus. Um, I had a lady try to tell me, "Oh, I'll sell you the box for two grand." I was like, "I'm all set." Um, you know, it it's a cool place. It's a nice atmosphere, but it's You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I will say this. Boston does a great job with tourism. You know, coming from Orlando as a as a uh, uh, industry here, that's so much tourism is in Orlando. Uh, I was in Boston last year and that that they've done a really good job. As a matter of fact, I think they've done a better job in New York City um, for the tourist area there. When you jump off the ferry in that whole area around the north end, um, it was it was clean. It was entertaining. I loved it. We had a great time. Yeah, no, it is. It is still a fun city. Uh, it's home for us, um, with the exception of the eight years that Nicole lived in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's pretty much home for her too. Um, <laughs> the um, yeah, no, I mean we still love it. It's it's not the most friendly with a lot of the things that we like to do in life, but we manage. Uh, we have New Hampshire to run to uh, for all of our fun stuff. But uh, enough about that. So, Jeff, now that we got you on the show and wanted to ask you a couple of things about you, uh, I actually don't know that much about you and your background. So how long have you been in the business? Well, this year, actually 2021, will be our 25th anniversary. So uh, Ah. I'm real excited about that. We've got some cool stuff coming out. Um, matter of fact, we have a press release probably going out in the next day or two about some new stuff that's coming out for our 25th anniversary, and we're going to celebrate it all year long. So, uh, uh, been in the business, uh, what fe- it doesn't feel like 25 years. I can tell you that it's gone by very quickly. And, yeah. uh, it's, uh, I gotta tell you, it's, it's rare that someone can, can, you know, go to work and be involved in something for, for 25 years and say, man, I still love it as much today as the day I started. Matter of fact, I love it even more because there's not as much of that, uh, you know, the, the financial pressure when you first start out, man, when you're worried about, you know, every week, even how to pay the bills and stuff. So, uh, right. I mean, we always have those pressures too, but, uh, once you're established and have this, it's sort of a, like a machine going where, you know, things are operating up things in place, but I started as a one man band. And so, uh, yeah, there was a lot of pressure going on then, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, now it's it's like um, it's actually even more enjoyable because we get to work on fun things and uh, spend time with you know with customers and 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 just actually be able to step back and enjoy a little bit about the uh, the cigar lifestyle. Because I always say when people start out, like if someone's going to open up a cigar shop or whatever, um, you're not the customer. You're there to make sure the customers are having a great time. So you rarely ever get to sit back. If you think you're going to open a cigar shop in a business and sit back and smoke cigars all day, um, you're probably not going to succeed in that business. You're, you're the guy right. that's supposed to be working all the time. So so it's nice now to be able to um, 
have a cigar and, and be involved in and in just so many different layers of the of the cigar industry with our you know from retail to to bar and and whiskey and single barrel picks and blending cigars and growing cigar tobacco and i mean it's just it's just we have this whole there's a lot of pies that we we that we have our fingers in when it comes to cigars yeah, yeah i've 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 heard of corona uh and the well i've heard of the experience i i've I know a little bit about it. Uh, I've, I've seen, I've seen the photos. It's, as I said, it, it's on my list. It's right at the top. It's one of the places I've been told like, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I, I know, I know some of the stuff you guys carry. You guys have an impressive lineup. Um, I know you guys are known for your, your bar too. You guys have a pretty, uh, pretty nice bar with a nice selection too. Yeah. From what I, from what I understand. <laughs> when we started though, when, when, when I started the company, it was, it was started with, uh, it was a mail order catalog company. And this is, this is our, uh, we still do a catalog. This is our new one for the yep. holidays. We got it. You got it? Hold on. I Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I just got this in the mail today. Right? <laughs> so you. I brought it down. But that's how, that's how Chrome yeah. Cigar started. It was with the mail order catalog. And obviously our first one didn't look anything like this. It was uh, 25 years ago. You didn't have things like <laughs> Adobe. And I mean, they were still shooting pictures with film. And and we're still doing plates on on uh, on presses. We didn't have all this this. Uh, Scanners were just invented when we did this. And when you first, if you scanned the scan of a picture, it came out all pixelated and stuff. So it was really, <laughs> it was a, uh, it was a different time back then. But um, so we started out with a mail order and then where we're at today with, with, uh, you know, we still do a lot of mail order business, especially this year with COVID and things. The, uh, our online business has gone crazy, but uh, the, the, the cigar bars and lounges and, and, and that concept of it, uh, is really fun because we are such a part of the community and such a part of the people's um, daily life where, you know, they can meet up with people and, and you'd be surprised how many people come to the cigar shop. You know, we have four locations. So there's three in Orlando and Orlando is a pretty big city. So there's one on the north, one right in downtown and one a little bit south. And then we have one in, in Tampa. But you'll be surprised how many people actually go to a cigar shop every day, smoke their cigars, um, Sometimes they're conducting business. Sometimes they're just, you know, uh, escaping whatever, you know, so they want to get out of the house, right, and talk to people mm-hmm. and have fun. So it's a really interesting um, – you'd be surprised how many, how many good things can happen in a cigar shop, people that you can meet and people that uh, – you just it's, – it's really strange some of the, the positive um, – let's say, I don't know if they're coincidental, coincidental meetings and stuff, but I always tell people, you hang out at a cigar shop, there's a good chance you're going to meet some, some, some cool people, but also that will somehow, um, just doors open, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Doors open. So there's a lot of, a lot of good things that, that happen and, and sort of brew inside the, the, the network of, of community that, that goes to the cigar shops. I've always said that a cigar shop is a very interesting place. Um, you know, any time I, I've ever gone into a cigar shop, especially like when I've had a bad day, maybe I'm not in the mood. I walk in, not really feeling it, but I grab my cigar, I pay for it, I cut it, I light it, give me 10 minutes, get my first like half an inch in the burn. And then all of a sudden it's like something just takes over you and you're sitting there and you're talking to people, you're enjoying the cigar and it's like you're in a... Your your mood and your mind just goes to a different place, and you're in a and you're in a and it's and it's I, something I've never had anywhere else. Where yeah. every time I'm in a cigar shop, everything else just doesn't matter. I always feel good. I always feel better, or I feel even happier than I was when I walked in. If, even if I was in a good mood, or uh, it just you feel even better. But it, it's like the cure all for for me is going into the cigar shop and you just you're hanging out with the guys. And you just you're shooting shit. You're like, hey, it just that that cigar lounge conversation is something like we all say, like, oh, it's like sitting in the lounge. But it's like it's that conversation specifically. It can go anywhere with anybody at any time, and you yeah. never know where it's gonna go. And there's always <laughs> like like at our stores. I mean, Orlando is is during normal times. You have a lot of people coming in town for conventions or sporting events or whatever. But you'd be surprised, you know, all of a sudden. You'll see, you know, this celebrity or this politician or or whoever comes in the store, and and it's uh, 
And it's such a broad spectrum. I'm telling you from, uh, let's say on the political spectrum, we had Reverend Al Sharpton in, and then we had uh, Rudy Giuliani in right after that. And so it's like, you can't have more, you know, different ends of the political spectrum, but yet people will sit around and smoke a cigar and talk. And uh, it's just, it's just a good place to be. Yeah, it's, it, it is a magical place. And, it, and and I think like we were saying earlier, like there's some shops I think that are maybe, I got to choose my words carefully. Not that any are bad, but there's just some shops that are maybe just the experience is better than others. Yeah. Uh, not that others are bad, just some of them just have like that really awesome experience. Like I'm, I know Corona is, um, <laughs> and you know, you, especially if, if it's your home, if it's your home local shop that you go to every day, or it's someplace you're, you're, you're on vacation, you're traveling, you go to a shop, it doesn't matter. They're all, it all has the same feel and you're right. It's a place where anyone can really come together. Um, I've seen newcomers come into shops their first day. They're like, yeah, I don't know shit about this. Tell me, what do I do? You, they, and they, they're showed something, they cut it, they light it. And then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're hanging out. Like they come in every Wednesday. You know what I find interesting too is that I have two young boys, one's 15 and one's uh, 11. But I tell people, you know, and you, you, uh, in Orlando we have a pretty big university as well, University of Central Florida, and we have a downtown store where all the nightclubs and bars and stuff are. And I tell people, you know, one of the safest places for a college uh, a student that's of age, over 21, uh, to hang out is actually in a cigar shop. And you know what? You'd be surprised the people they meet and the, and the opportunities that could come out of that. And yeah. it's in, and so I was, I always thought that was kind of cool. Like we would have, sometimes we'd have parents that come up to Orlando, drop off their son. And then the last night in town, they would be at Corona Cigar and then, Hey, they're Hey Jeff, let me, I like you to meet my son. I'm leaving. He's, he's going to be in Orlando and, and, uh, you know, I'm coming, going back down to Fort Lauderdale, Miami, whatever. And, um, uh, it's pretty cool that, uh, you know, it's, it's like a safe, it's, it's, it's a safe environment too. You know, they're not going to get in trouble. They're not going to get mixed up with a bad crowd and things. So, uh, I think it's interesting, but also what's good about that is that the cigar lifestyle is, it, it, it goes from all people ask all the time, what's your target, you know, demographics and everything else. I so, say, you know what, actually it's from 21 up to, you know, is, is 65, 85, however, you know, Abu Avezin used to come here every day. Heck, he was 85 years old driving his car here. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like, uh, so you can have all different uh, folks from age age brackets and, and groups, but they'll sit and talk to each other. You know what I mean? You'll have a guy that was, let's say this is a, a lobbyist here that used to be a, uh, a congressman and he's, you know, up, he's, a, he's an older guy. Let's say he's 70 years old and here he is. He's got a young guy. Who knows? He's studying political science at UCF, you know, and, and these things happen. I'm telling you, they meet up. Um, and, or you, this guy here is a, a retired basketball player. This guy here wants to be a sports agent. Next thing you know, you know, it's just, you see some weird mentoring and I, I say weird in a good way, but mm -hmm. weird that you would like, damn, I never thought that that connection would have happened. Right. But yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's really good. Let me ask you this question. So since you kind of brought it up and it's something that I've, I've had conversations with, um, several people around and in, in my neck of the woods, do you notice now as, as a, as a shop owner, do you notice a younger demographic more today than you have in the past? Well, when you say in the past, I would say yes, if you're going back to, to when we started, which was in the 90s. Okay. Um, but, but yes, now, and I'll tell you why. Uh, in my opinion, it's because the newer, the younger generation has more access to information. Uh, there's so much information on, you know, mm -hmm. online, on the internet, shows like this, that you've got uh, folks that are, understanding cigars because before when i first started the internet was out there and we were actually one of the first stores to have an online st store uh it was in 1997 that's when the technology uh, was developed for what was called a secure socket layer where you actually could put a credit card through online and but there was like there was an aol chat room on cigars and it hmm. was sort of like the way reddit is today but um you couldn't until the internet came about you didn't have that flow of information about cigars. Now we see guys that are new in the cigars. They read about it on, you know, they, they see these, there's so many groups and shows like this, right? They already know about cigars. If you go back pre-internet days, 
there was so much misinformation about cigars. Most people will thought, yo, you inhale it, and it's like a cigarette, and you're going to get hooked, and it's going to be this. You know, I'm going to get addicted. And, all. and it's like they didn't know any better because they were just – the only thing they saw was what was on MTV um, saying, you know, the truth campaigns trying to label – you know, like all smoking is smoking, but they didn't even know how to smoke a cigar, right? And so when people would try it first time, you'd say, listen, you don't inhale that, right? And and so think about that. Now, I don't think there's too many people that smoke cigars that, that didn't know you don't inhale them. But, you know, 25 years ago, you had people that didn't know, and they were trying to like smoke it like a cigarette. Next thing you know, they're 20 minutes later, they're puking, right? Because you don't inhale yeah. a cigar, <laughs> right? And so, so I would say that's part of the reason why the younger – uh, folks that get involved in cigars, they just have so much more of appreciation and understanding of how a cigar is made, um, how, where the different tobaccos come from, what's the difference between a full-bodied cigar and a mild cigar and a medium cigar. And that, that matters because remember, I don't know what your first cigar was, but if you walked into a cigar shop, let's say 25, 30 years ago, and had no guidance and you might have just picked up, so oh, I'm going to pick up a Cuban cigar. We don't have Cubans here, but let's say you pick up something real strong. It's your first cigar. If you feel sick after smoking that first cigar, you're never going to have a second cigar. So oh, yeah. You're never, you're never going to actually enjoy the, the cigar lifestyle or the experience because you started out wrong. And I think and the biggest part of it, too, not to cut you off there, is I think that a lot of shops are, are really good today at also – First, like you were saying, there's information out there that gets people in the shop and then they're kind of like, OK, I'm here. I'm ready to try it and I'm really open to this. But then you have good staff, too, that knows to ask those questions like, all right, so you're a new smoker. So why don't you start off with something mild and we'll work you up the chain and just kind of see like where you're at. They kind of get a feel for like other things that they enjoy. Try to figure out what their palate is, even though they haven't smoked before. Try to get them in the right direction. They give them that first cigar. What did you think of that one? Well, I really didn't like it. Why didn't you like it? And normally they have some reason. Oh, it was too bitter. It gave me, made me lightheaded, blah, blah, blah. All right. And then they go from there. Well, let's try this now. And I feel like kind of to like build on what you were saying is like, I think the, from my experience, most shops I go into, the staff, I think are really on their game too, with helping those people understand the products that are in the, in the showrooms. But that's because they have access to things like this. Yeah. So guys that are coming in, the talent pool of folks that are that are actually working the stores, they know more. So mm -hmm. that that's changed a lot too. So it's been it's been different in a good way. And I and I I'm bullish on I'm bullish on the cigar industry, and I don't think it'll ever go away. Um, it's been around since you know Christopher Columbus discovered America with the natives uh, smoking cigars. So if it's lasted 500 years. Why would it ever stop? Right. I know. It's uh, it's there's always dangers out there, and we talk about it on the show. There's there's people who are very anti-tobacco in general, uh, and then there's people who are just anti-cigar because they they rope it in with everything else, um, you know. And you're right. It's it's reasons why when we talk about it, you know, there's reasons that we support Cigar Rights of America, uh, the PCA, and all those groups out there, and that's why, you know, we got this. Like you said, this is a, an industry that's been around a long time. It's something that's been people have been doing for a long time. It's, you know, it, there's worse things that you could do <laughs> in the world. So, so, so Matt, <laughs> let me ask you this. So yeah. for, I don't know, 40 years, there's been the war, the government's war on drugs. Yep. Marijuana, if you look at where it was 40 years ago versus today, and we're talking about billions of dollars spent on that and people incarcerated and all kinds of stuff. And yet all of a sudden you're seeing marijuana is like uh, is a booming industry. Right. And so you can see how even if the government tries everything and anything to stop people, people still want to try it. Right. Right. So I don't care what happens on cigars, even if you outlawed them, cigars would still exist. Unfortunately, Corona cigar wouldn't exist, but there would be some sort of underground way of selling and, and buying cigars, whether people just buy them online and get them from a foreign country, whatever. Well, my point is, is no matter how much you tell people they can't have something, people are going to find a way. Oh, yeah. They want what they can't have, too. So, you, like, you, yeah, like you were saying, like, even if you even if you take it away, someone's going to it's still going to make it happen. Yeah. Like, I, I may have to start a Corona <laughs> cigar in Europe somewhere and just start shipping into America. Like, who knows? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So the industry's not going away. And uh, and it's good. It shouldn't go away. 
it's a, it's something that's a pleasure that, uh, man, I, I, I say it all the time. If we didn't have right now, if we didn't have the local cigar shop for a lot of people, um, you know, we, we, we have a problem in, in not just America, but everywhere right now. Um, uh, the, the, the art of conversation is being lost too yeah. many. That's the bigger thing. When you talk about kids and what I see as a threat is I see kids that, that have no, um, social skills on how to interact with another person in IRL, right. In real life, they, they just, they, I don't know if they get nervous or they just, it's a really weird phenomenon. What I see um, high school or even college kids. And, and it's like, well, man, I don't, they don't know how to converse with each other. Right. And, and I think that's, that's, uh, you know, cigars can at least help bridge that. I'll tell you, this is a funny, not a funny story, but a cool story. So one of our customers, we were at a, um, just hanging out at, at, we call them the Coronians. It's a group of cigars, guys that met a Corona and go, they go do things. Right. So right. they invited my wife and I to go And this one fellow, his son, who was uh, 21, and he goes, and, he, and him and I were speaking and stuff. And then later he goes, you know, he goes, you know what happened for me being around my dad and all your, all the customers of Corona Cigar? He goes, man, it totally brought me out of my shell. He goes, I was so, I, he goes, I, I didn't know how to function. He goes, once I started, and he, and he goes, you guys always treated me with respect, like as if I was an adult. He is an adult, right? But it was really, this kid confided in me that it was cigars and the group of guys that smoke cigars that brought him out of his shell. And I'm talking about when I say bringing him out of his shell, but as in somebody that was kind of fearful even of being around people to talk. Right. And, and I think that, that that I can see that in some of the eyes of some of some some younger people that they get around people and, and you know, they, they kind of shrivel up because they're they feel nervous. Right. But um, the cigars help them with that. And he's like, man, he goes in this kid. It's just man, it just opened them up. It's amazing. So. So anyway, I think it's a, it's that's another good thing. That's uh the magic of cigars. <laughs> yeah, I think that cigars are. I think the biggest thing that's important about them is the is the social aspect. I think that they bring people together. Uh, there's a comment in the in the um, in the Facebook feed, um, and it says, "I've often told my daughter that if she's traveling and she ever needs a safe place because of anything, head over to any cigar lounge near her and then call me." Yeah. Um, you walk into most cigar lounges, you're gonna you're gonna see an environment of people who are very laid back. They're willing to help. They'll talk to you. You know, you, it's it's not a it's not a stuffy room, to say the least. You know, it's. It it's used to be a, though. That's when I first started in the cigar business. It used to be. And I'll I've tell heard you. I've heard stories. Yeah, so I I started smoking cigars about 30 years ago, and. I, you know, I was a blue collar worker. I had uh, my 30 years ago, I was running automotive, uh, uh, automotive re repair center. My father was a family business, yep. very successful, doing well, but I wore a uniform. And so um, I remember, man, there was a local cigar shop in Orlando. And if you didn't have like on a suit and tie, and Orlando is not a suit and tie uh, city, by the way. But if you didn't, if you weren't dressed up like that and it was, and it had a country club feel to it, right? And man, it was like stuffy and, and, and it just not only intimidating, but uninviting, right? Almost like if you, if you weren't, if you weren't a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, you didn't belong there. Right. Right. And so to me, that was probably one of the best experiences ever, because that's what inspired me to open Corona Cigar, the retail stores, the way we did. Right. Because I knew right away that there's a lot of guys with a lot of money that, don't dress like lawyers and, and dress all fancy, right? Because, you know, this dude might own a plumbing company that he's worth, you know, millions of dollars, or this guy's got a, a whatever. He's, he could be the septic tank guy, right? When, you're, when, you, when your septic tank backs up, that his phone rings, and those guys make money, right? So it's like, you, but they love cigars, and you got, they, they can afford it just as much as anybody else. So I was like, I want to make a place that's, that's luxurious but welcoming for everybody. And the other thing about Florida is that most of the guys that have a lot of money, they're not wearing Brioni suits. They're wearing Tommy Bahama shorts and shirts. And, <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? So we have a totally different uh, a, a, a look to, to sometimes, you know, wealthy fellas. So um, a lot of times if you have it where it's, too, where it's all stuffy and, and super posh, 
people that are there actually they don't have any money anyway. All their money's tied up in their clothes. They don't have any money for cigars. So it's like, yeah. you, it's, it's, it's a, it, anyway, it worked out well because when we opened Corona Cigar, remember there was a lot of clubs that you needed a membership to be a member to come in and smoke. And I'm like, this is crazy. I said, you don't need a membership to get in Corona Cigar. I said, the only membership card you need is American Express, Visa, MasterCard, Discover. That's <laughs> it, man. You can come right in. So we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we just want customers. I don't. And so it was a smart thing to do. And one of the things that the very first thing when we trained our staff is as you treat everybody that walks through the door, you treat them like a millionaire. Because I don't care if they're they got any money or not. Everybody likes to be treated like a millionaire. Right. They don't like to be prejudged. And so if you're treating them like a millionaire, he'll tell you if something's too expensive. But if if you try to. I remember I opened the store in Sand Lake. It's a wealthy area. And, I, and this customer gave me the best lesson of my life. He wanted a box of oil to Monterey Excalibur number ones, and we were out. But I said, you know what? I got some, I got some Don Tomas seconds in bundles. And I said, these are $29.95. And, uh, you know, Excalibur is about 110 bucks a box at the time. And the guy looks at me right in the eye. And, he, and, he, and I swear he looks, he hands the bundle back to me. He was a kid. This ain't a bundle neighborhood. And he walked out the freaking door. I, I offended the guy. I pissed them off. Right. Yeah. So I learned a lesson real quick. I'm like, dude, don't, if a guy wants a bundle, let him tell me, but don't, don't, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, if you go to Ruth Chris and say, hey, I'm out of filet, but I got, I got a McDonald's cheeseburger. He's going like, dude, don't give me that shit. I'm just, you know, <laughs> so, so it was, it was a good lesson to learn. And, uh, there's, there's a respectful way to treat people and they'll tell you what they want to spend, but never, ever, ever make that decision for them. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm go- I'm going to steal that from you, Nicole. That's a good one because I, I've said that, but in not as crisp and, and concise of a way you just said that. Don't shop with your own wallet because I've always said, listen, the cost of something, whether it's expensive or not, is in the eye of the guy that's buying it. Yep. Right? If Bill Gates comes in here right now, because we look at our bar, right? We have crazy amount of whiskeys. We've got the most expensive bottle we sold to, to date was $72,000 for a bottle of single malt scotch. It was a Macallan 72 in the leak crystal. Ooh. And I, there's going to be a more expensive one out in the future, right? Now, $72,000 for a bottle of scotch is a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. But guess what? If you're Bill Gates or if you're or Elon Musk or, or the, and Jeff Bezos, what's 72 grand? It's nothing. Nothing. Right. So it depends on the buyer. So that's why it's you know back to the thing. Don't shop with your own wallet. So, uh, but if that guy wants it, you know we've got it. That's what that's and that's what we're in the business of providing. We're in the business of providing. Them. If somebody wants to come into Corona Cigar, and drink a 50, 60, 70 year old single malt scotch, we got it. Doesn't mean you have to, right? I got 10 and 12 year as well, but we've got it. We, we can take you, we can take you all the way up. So so. Uh, be warned if you come in and you tell and you're buying a, a drink for you and you say you can have anything you want on the menu. Don't do that in our place because you can get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny you, you bring up the uh, the blue collar lifestyle. Uh, so I, I I don't know if you know, but you know by day I'm an electrician. So oh, nice. I work with the tools all day. I yep. spent I spent my day bending pipe all day today and there it was a hell of a day. But you know what? It's funny you you say that because it's like I feel like there's a lot of people. Um, who they see the blue collar worker. They see the guy leaving with boots on. He's covered in dust like I did today. Um, and it's like, oh, this is why you got to stay in school. You don't want to be like that guy. That guy is getting in a $70,000 pickup right. truck to drive home. That's right. And it's like, oh, it's like, yeah, oh, these guys work. He make money. You know what That's I mean? Right. So don't, you know, I watch these guys coming to cigar shops too. At the end of the day, they get the high vis on, they get the boots on. And like, oh, here we go. And they're like, yeah, let me get a uh, box of Padrones and let me get a, yep. let me see, we got a, let me get a couple boxes of Liga. And it's like, they throw it down like it's nothing. But that's, that's Absolutely. It. Yeah. 
So unless, and that was probably, listen, I say everything in life happens for a reason. I mean, I started out in that industry. And so uh, being blue collar, I knew, I mean, listen, I remember my father walking into a Cadillac dealership. He had his, he had his Cintas uniform on and, and uh, the dude didn't want to even show him the car. And so he walked right out, went to another one and, and he, he bought the thing with cash. I mean, it was a mechanic with an auto. I was a little kid. He had a gas station and he, and he's, fixing cars. And I was, and I learned real quick, there's, there's tons of guys like that, tons of guys like that. So when I see guys that, that, that are tradesmen, I know he's got money. There's no yeah. question about it. He's got, cause they're, <laughs> cause they're making money. I know it. And so, and it's really good to see nowadays too, because I, I tell you what, tradesmen, in my opinion, are finally getting the respect that they deserve. And when I was a tradesman, we didn't have a uh, discovery channel that wasn't even out yet. But things like Discovery Channel and A and E that that did these shows like uh, Deadliest Catch and and things like uh, uh, the American Chopper and all these other things you know, now they're making knives on TV and all this other stuff. People have learned to appreciate uh, tradesmen and skilled craftsmen, right? Right. In the past, um, it was always like, oh, you don't want to do that. You want to go to college, and then these kids are getting you know crazy in debt with a degree that they can't find a job that that. That that's even in that field or really even pay for what they went to school for. And here they are. It's like, you know, if you would learn a trade and, be, and became good at it. And I always tell two people too, I said, listen, if you're a tradesman, learn business as well, because what you, the real opportunity as well is that if you're a tradesman is in, in, in this is why I love America is that we have the ability to start your own business as well. So whether you're a plumber, electrician, whatever it is, whatever that trade is, there's a point in time you save your money, save your money, save your money, and at some point, you know, you'll you have your own business, and then you can, uh, you, you know, some people want to start businesses, some don't. When you start a business, there's a ton of risk that goes with it, um, and sometimes it's hard to to take that leap, especially if you have kids and you're like, you know, dude, I got to make sure I can pay for this, this, and this, because when you do start a business, um, it's probably better to do it when you're single or unless your wife is working with you as well. Because you have to be able to, um, you know, if you got to eat, uh, uh, you know, beanie weenies and stuff and, 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 and rice patties for the next month or two because you got no money, uh, but you got to put gas in the service truck or buy parts or whatever, you need, to, you need to put the money where it belongs is in your business, not in a boat and, you know, other things like that. That comes later. But um, so, so that's just my advice on trade is that the trade is great. Um, but if, you know, if, if, if you feel like you've got the, 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 the inner fire that you want to work 80 to 100 hours for the first couple of years um, in, in this country, you can do it. Right. No, I think that's really well said. Uh, and, and that's a that's a subject I don't even think we've really gotten into on the show. Uh, and it definitely hits home for me. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad we got into that. It's, it's really well said, and I think it's really important. I think there's, like you said, there's, there's, the respect is finally there for trades. Is seeing more and more, you know, kids, you know, leaving school and going into a trade, or even there's more kids going to technical high schools now and yeah. feeling out like what's out there. And then when they graduate, okay, I'm gonna go this way because I've already sampled everything and it, I like this. I'm gonna do that. And they don't go to college. And it's funny when I went to uh, when I was in my apprenticeship. I remember on the first first day, they put us in orientation. They said, I'm going to tell you guys something, especially for you guys who could come right out of high school. Your friends who are at the big school right now, getting wasted and going to class, they're going to leave in four years, and they're going to have a degree, and they're going to go work you know, in some office somewhere doing whatever, and they're going to have like $125,000 in student debt. In the five years that it takes you to get through your apprenticeship, you're going to have a license for a trade, and you're going to be making $125,000 a year or more, and you're going to owe nothing. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, too. And you get all your benefits and, and all that with it, too. And, it, and it's like it's so many people are like, ah, I don't know, trades. I'm going to go to school and be smart. But then you know, they get these jobs, and they make like 40 grand a year, and they're like miserable. And like I hate being in front of a computer all day. And it's like, well... You know, if you can deal with the cold, if you can deal with getting dirty and you can deal with putting yourself through a little bit more physical labor, you know, you can lead a better life. <laughs> and also you can fix stuff when it's broken. 
And Nicole, yeah. when you, I, I don't know about this. You have to answer this one, but I've heard that women like men that can fix stuff. That's true. That's true. Yeah, Nicole, Nic Nicole's <laughs> also no slouch. Nicole also can, she can work with her hands too. She's well, very capable know, of <laughs> building stuff. I'm glad stuff. you brought that up because you know, it's weird now, not weird, but it's different. More women, I've seen women that have learned, I know more women that can fix stuff than, than a lot of guys now. You know what I mean? That that they watch these programs. Look at these do it your DIY programs on TV. Half of them are women that are slam, you know, cutting walls and doing this and that. And so yeah. I think it's great because it you know makes them independent and that and that they can they you know they don't feel like they've got as vulnerable when 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 something breaks or whatever. So I, I love the fact that and I and, and the other thing is too, um I think a woman can do anything a man can when it comes to skilled trade, as long as, you know, obviously if the amount of weight they can pick up or something, you know, can you, you lug 120 pounds over their back? I mean, some women probably can, but not, not all. But what I'm saying, the, the mental capacity to fix, diagnose, and actually do that work, it's, I don't think there's any difference with men. No, I mean, I, even going to job sites every day, I see more and more women in trades too. I mean, there's, there's women fitters, there's electricians that I see, you know, women up there, you know, with, with four inch cast iron pipe hanging it in the ceiling by themselves. And it's like, wow, you know, you didn't, you yeah. didn't see that once upon a time. And it was just, there was a man's place. And now there's women up there. They're some of them working harder than some of the guys on the crew. <laughs> the, and, and you know what? The last store that we opened in Tampa, the, the uh, project manager was a woman and she freaking was amazing. She yeah. really knew her stuff too. And I enjoyed working with her. So, um, yeah, it, I've we've lived it and worked with it, and I think it's I think it's fantastic. It's uh look, it's definitely uh it's a great way to live. I I, you know, I like how you uh you know you, you said you know you come from the blue collar background. I think that's um not that not that if you don't it's bad, but I definitely the conversations I've had with those people who have that experience who understand that way of life. It's a different conversation, and it's a conversation I can relate to, and I totally respect it. I appreciate it. I love those conversations because I feel like this the view on life is a little bit different um, for people who've who've had to do that that physical hard work all day. And I think that it makes a difference. And whether you stick with it or you don't, I, I mean, I know people that who didn't stick with it and they went somewhere else with life, but that experience it gave them the tools and it gave them a, a different mentality to do anything else in life, no matter what it was. Just because it's it's a certain it's a certain mindset, you know what I'm saying? It, when uh, they go to IKEA, they know how to assemble whatever they bought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one way to look uh, at it. So Jeff, so since we uh, since we got you on the show, uh, you're gonna show us some things in a second. But first, I want to hit our news segment really quick. Um, our news segment brought to you by McAuliffe Cigars. If you are an ambassador, you know about all the fun. If you're not, head over to McAuliffe. Buy some uh, McAuliffe cigars. Get the passport tasting pack. Be an ambassador today. Um, so we only have one item on the news today, and that's going to be the California's flavored tobacco ban is delayed until signature verification process complete. Um, I know that it was supposed to go in on January 1, 2021, which is a few weeks, obviously, and I, I believe now it's pushed off another year to 2022. Yep. Uh, if I read that correctly. Um, Jeff, obviously you are a, a major retailer. You have a catalog, you have an online business as well as your brick and mortar. But um, so you can definitely weigh, on, weigh in on this too. Um, we see this, we've had this conversation, Carney and I, guests that have been on the show. We have it here in Massachusetts. There's a flavored tobacco ban now in Massachusetts. And for us, I really didn't see it become such an issue until, and I've had this conversation with um, people like, you know, David Garofalo up here, who I know you know really well, um, who owns a shop just over the border of Massachusetts and who has seen the, seen the effects of this. Um, it wasn't really until the vape thing happened a few years ago when all the kids had all the flavored vapes and they were, you know, some kids were getting sick, a couple of kids died. And I remember at the time, Charlie Baker, who's our governor, just shut all the vape shops down. We're like, nope, shut them down till we figure this all out. And then, you know, just as some time went on, it was like, you know what? We're removing all flavored tobacco. You can't even get Newports in Massachusetts anymore. And I remember, you know, being in the shops up 
you know, in Salem, New Hampshire, which is the stone's throw away over the border, all these people come in and go, do you guys have new ports? Do you guys have this? Do you guys have this? All the Massachusetts people who wanted flavored tobacco are now coming to New Hampshire because they know, well, live free or die. They have it up there. Um, California now, you see them in the same boat. Not really a surprise. Massachusetts and California seem to be kind of similar on a lot of their ideologies that they have. Um, but as someone who's on a different side of the table in the industry, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you see this becoming a nationwide thing someday where stuff like acid and all the flavored cigars that we have just won't exist here anymore? Um, or maybe in just very, very select states? This, this whole subject for me is, is it's mind boggling that it's even happening. I understand that they're trying to, uh, keep kids from using uh, tobacco or vaping. Um, but the whole idea that you can have, or the, the, the notion that an adult doesn't like a flavored product in itself is untrue. Mm. If, if, that, if, if adults didn't like flavored products, you wouldn't have all of these flavored vodkas and heck, we wouldn't have cocktails for that matter. We'd all just be drinking straight whiskey. And so the idea that adults don't like flavor is not true. So the idea that the government says, well, we don't want kids uh, smoking a flavored cigar. Okay, we, we just raised the tobacco use to 21. Mm. So they're not allowed to buy it anyway. So what are you actually achieving by banning the flavors? You're just putting a ban on a product they sh- that they can't legally buy anyway. So all you're really doing is banning adults from flavored products. That's really what you've done. You've banned the adults from making a decision to enjoy a flavored tobacco product. And that's where I have a problem. It's, it's just hypocritical. Then if you say, oh, well, we're doing it for, you know, they used to use the line that uh, strawberry blunt kids were hollowing it out and rolling up marijuana in it. Well, here, 10 years later, California and these other in Colorado and so many other states are like, well, kids can smoke marijuana anyway now. So you've, you've legalized marijuana, but you've made a flavored cigar illegal. I don't get it. And, and, the, and the whole thing that they used to talk about was the reason to ban the flavored cigar was to keep kids from smoking weed. You get the weed's legal now and the cigar's not. Does that make <laughs> sense? I mean, it's, I, I don't Backwards. understand this. Right. Right. <laughs> and so I, it, I don't know how to. I think what happens is, is that tobacco, there's so much money involved in the anti-tobacco crusade because they get all this money from the master settlement agreement, all these tobacco taxes. A lot of it goes to these groups that, 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 that are anti-tobacco groups. And then the target that they attack is no one shows up to the city council meeting. No one shows up to the county commission meeting to, to voice opposition. Um, and that's why it goes through. So do I think it's going to happen? It's going to, yeah, it's going to continue to happen. However, uh, from what I understand, you've got to stay in, in Pennsylvania over Philadelphia's flavor ban, and it's going to have to be won through the courts. Um, but I don't, I, you know, they're going to have to pick and choose the battles because this is so expensive to do these, these battles in court. I just think it's crazy that, that if you think that, banning flavored tobacco products, whatever that that motive is, is going to keep kids from vaping. I just don't see it happening. And besides that, when the kids were vaping and they got sick, it wasn't because they were trying to vape uh, a jewel. They were trying to vape stuff to get them high. Right. And they got some bad stuff in there. You know, listen, it's just like experimenting with any drugs. You know, you start taking mushrooms or whatever the hell else or heroin and stuff – there's a good chance you can die from that stuff. Mm. So do you ban the vape category because, you know, 10 or 15 people were buying something to put in their vape pipe that they knew they were trying to make themselves high and it killed them. And no one wants that to happen, but that can, that can happen whenever you try to do anything that you're trying to, you know, that does, does anybody take drugs and say, no, I think these are good for me. Of course not. You know, there's a, there's a risk involved. So, so I don't know where this is going to end up. I, I can tell you that it's going to be a problem, and, and that's just the that's just the world we live in right now, where yeah. where things are a little wacky. So um, 
I, if it happens in Florida, I'll be the first guy to oppose it. We'll be the, we'll put everything we have into fighting it. Because listen, I enjoy a flavored cigar. If the question too is that oh, there's no such thing as a premium flavored cigar, that's not true. That's not true at all. I consider acid a, a premium cigar. At least these things are 12, 14 bucks. Yeah. How is that? How is that? How is that not a premium cigar? We sell the heck out of Javas and and tobacco specials. I mean, there's a lot of adults that enjoy these things, and even before that. I mean, aroma season cigar has been around since the days of triangular trade. When you put the tobacco inside rum barrels, that's how a rum season cigar came. And you had people that used to dip cigars in cognac. You have a cognac flavored cigar. Um, you know, Gurkha's got a cognac flavored cigar. I think it's eighteen dollars. This isn't, you know, this isn't a two for ninety five cent cigar. So, yeah, it's 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 something we battled for a long time. I know the industry, some people in the industry are like, ah, hell with flavors. It's not important. Well, I think it is because you know how many guys, it, this is what's interesting. We've got buy, guys that will buy acid cigars and will also buy Padron anniversaries and Davidoffs, the same customer. So the notion that these guys don't buy, you know, that they don't smoke premium cigars just because they consider something flavored is not premium. That's totally not true. I'll tell you as a retailer, that is totally not true. So it's an important category. Uh, we'll continue to fight it, but it's going to be a long battle. I always, I always um, find it interesting to to ask people such as yourself that question, and because the response, I mean, it's always uh, the response is always similar, but it's I, I always like to hear like the the standpoint on it, and because yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's for you that's a business and that's a product where I don't know what your margins are and certain stuff you sell, but there's there's a good percentage of your business that comes from that category. And in a state where it gets taken away, you know, that's whatever that percentage is, it's enough where that's lost revenue for you because of why, because someone felt that it was just like, well, flavors are bad for anyone. Um, and it's going to lead kids onto smoking and they're going to all die. Uh, so let's just take it away. But you're right. It's like, well, they can't buy it anyway. Now the smoking age federally is 21. So, I mean, you can vote and you can um, you can sign up for the military, but you, you can't buy a cigar, let alone buying a flavored cigar. So let me ask you, Matt, where do you think these guys are buying their Newports now that that has been illegal? Because I'm sure they're still buying them. Well, like I said, I, I've I've been in the shops in New Hampshire, which are right over all right over the border, and they're all just they're coming over the border to other states where it's legal. Nah, there's people that aren't going to do that. There's, there's, I can tell you right now that there's illegal sales of Newport cigarettes happening. Oh, you mean like that? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. yeah, of course I believe that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so now what we've done is we've criminalized something that used to be a legal business, buying a pack of Newports at your 7 yep. Eleven. So now the guy's buying it from, he's buying it somewhere. You know yeah. what I mean? There's, there's some dude around the corner or something that's got his little underground Newport cigarette stand or something, but the guys are still buying them. But what you've done now is you've made honest businessmen. You've turned people into criminals. Right. It's weird because it's like you used to go and you'd meet up with some guy and buy, you know, buy some weed off of him. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I need, I need some I need a couple of grams of weed. Whatever. Now it's like, well, you can go buy weed anywhere at a dispensary and it's no big deal. Now you're going to some guy's house because like, hey, man, I got a couple cartons of Newports. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ooh. <laughs> it's crazy. How, how much for a pack? Oh, man, these are hot right now. <laughs> and to me, it's wild. So as you said earlier, I lived in the UK. And when I lived in the UK, the smoking age was 16. So you could go buy cigarettes at 16 years old. And they've tightened. Even back then, you could smoke cigarettes in pubs. And they, they changed that as I lived there. They had upped it to 18. And then they did away with smoking and in, you know inside. But it's just... I don't know. And not a lot of people did it. <laughs> yeah. I, At 16. But anyway, it's going to continue. This this, this is going to happen and it's going to continue. And unfortunately, what's really weird is going to happen in the more, um, and it's, you don't even want to use the word liberal. It's going to happen in the more democratic controlled states because they're going to pass legalized or decriminalization of drugs, but criminalization of Newports mm. or any flavored cigar. Or any, you know, so it's just, I've never seen it, it but anyway, it's, it is what it is. And... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that's the world we live in today. Um, you just, it, yeah, it, it's, and it's strange, like the, it's something as simple as like Newport cigarettes, that's, that's considered an outlawed product now. But I mean, yeah. I was a kid, that was just like, you know, like 
I remember everyone smoking Newport cigarettes. Now it's like in Massachusetts, it's like if you got Newport cigarettes, you know, you're a king. Yeah. You know where'd what I mean? You get those? Oh, where'd you get them? Where'd you get them? Um, yeah, I, I listened to, you know, I remember when I was in trade school a few years ago, and when, when the, uh, when the flavored stuff and like the jewel pods, like the flavored jewel pods, like went out. Guys were like, yeah, I got to go up to New Hampshire this weekend. You know, guys who live in like the South Shore of Boston, so it's a little out of the way. Yeah, why? Oh, I got to go grab like a bunch of cases of uh, jewels because like I can't get them here. So they're, they're spending like their Saturday going up to New Hampshire to get, you know, strawberry jewel pods because they just can't get them like five minutes down the road anymore. Uh, you know, it's it's crazy. It, it, it really is. <laughs> but well. um, like you said, it's this is the world we live in now and it, it's, it's not going to get any better. Um, but anyway, that's, I mean, we're going to wrap up the news segment there. I mean, like I said, that was the only thing we had on the, uh, on the docket for the week. Um, but now that we've passed, now that we've gotten past that. So Jeff, I know you had some things you wanted to show us. I'm going to finally let you get into that. Cause it sounds like you have some stuff laid out. You were saying, um, I'll let you start wherever you want. I don't know what you have. So this is, yep. So I have phone. the promos lined up here, um, and I can throw them on screen. You might be able to see them. Um, not through Skype, but I can read them off if you Facebook. don't have them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I, no, I have, I just okay. wanted to go over some of the things that I thought you, you asked, what are some of the cool gifts that yep. people, um, for this holiday season? And I thought, you know what? Well, we've got things that cover all different, uh, segments of the, of the price uh, yep. category. So, um, I just want to show some of the stuff that I think are some of the, the nicest gifts that are out there that are packaged well. Yep. And I just want to start this diamond crown one. I think this is one of my favorites. I love diamond crown cigars. They're, um, JC Noon, one of the great families in the cigar business. I love those guys. And, uh, Eric and Bobby are real good friends. And diamond crown has this nice little leather cigar. Oh, I have that. That's holder. awesome. Yeah. And yeah. right. And inside yeah, yeah. you open it up, it's got the three diamond crowns. you get a, a diamond crown in the Cameroon, which is not available uh, normally, the Cameroon, so you can only get in this three uh, uh, gift assortment. Julius Caesar, which I love, medium bodied. So you get the Julius Caesar, Diamond Crown Cameroon, and then a Maximus, which is more the medium to full bodied cigar. Mm. So three bellicosas. These are big cigars, by the way. So they're about se- probably seven by 54. So this one here, um, we've got them in the stores online at 59.95. So it's a great little uh, affordable gift for the cigar lover. So I, I wanted to show that one. Um, which, which, by the way, while we're on the subject, do, I, do you get the uh, do you get the toast across America packets? Yeah, we does? sure do. Yes. So for like the last couple of years, I don't know if you have the 2020 ones yet, but uh, I, I think they're the same as the last two years. They get the, the sharks and they get an opus and they have that Julius Caesar shark. And I know yes. people probably go crazy because, oh, there's an opus in there. But I'm telling you, don't sell that Julius Caesar shark short. Those are amazing. I love those. Yeah, great cigars, and we get a, we've been doing that the Toast Across America cigar since they started. So, mm. and it feels like they've been doing that for twenty something years. So every every year we buy a lot of those, by the way, and uh, we don't make any money on that. the 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 money goes um, to the charity, so mm. that's a, a nice uh, gift to get. Um, that helps out the cigar fa- uh, cigar family charitable foundation in Dominican Republic. So that's a that's a great one there. Um, also. You know, Padron. Padron is always a great gift for you know, if you don't know anything about cigars, you can give somebody a box of Padrones. Um, there's a, quite a few samplers that Padron uh, makes. We always have them in stock. You don't always see them in the stores just because samplers, you know, around other than Christmas time, aren't always the best. Uh, you know, humidor shelf space is, is always tight. But this one here, I think, is pretty cool. So this one's got the Damaso. It's got the regular Padron series, the Padron 64, the 26th. And then it's got the uh, 45th anniversary. So that, that's a really cool assortment. Um, $85.55. So um, anybody that smokes cigars, you get them a, a Padron anniversary series type of sampler. They're, like I said, there's three different ones that they make. Um, that one is, uh, I'll call it the entry level one. From there, they get the the, uh, the other anniversary series. This one is $98.80. A little more money, but... It's got all the 1964 anniversaries, and check, see the A in there? That's a great set. Yeah. That, I love that set, too. I've had that set. Oh, that is a great buy. Yeah. So that A is a real special cigar. You usually can't find that A anywhere. 
So uh, close to about a hundred bucks. But again, if you're a cigar looking for a gift for the cigar people, that's a great gift to get. Um, another one that we have, uh, you know, we do a lot of da a lot of Davidoff cigars. We're, we've got our Davidoff store in Tampa. Um, I always like to talk about our exclusive uh, Davidoff cigars. You know, we have got our our uh, FSG farm in Claremont where we grow our own cigar tobacco. And uh, we sent a few years ago some of our crop to uh, Davidoff in Dominican Republic. And this is the Davidoff Tampa exclusive. If you see that, it's got the city skyline of, Dav of uh, Tampa. That's cool. All right. And this is the Tampa FSG where this version has Florida sun grown tobacco in it. So you can see these are beautiful cigars. Anything from Davidoff is always super luxurious. Uh, it's like Rolex. Um, anybody that gets a Davidoff cigar would definitely be like, wow, that was a nice gift. Um, you know, they're, they're pricey. Um, this is $225 for, for 10. Uh, but again, Davidoff is like I like to call the top of the range when it comes to uh, luxury products. And especially when you put the, the FSG in it, it's not unlike any other uh, Davidoff cigar. So I wanted to highlight that one for you. <clears throat> There's another um, cool thing we did this year. You know, I like to drink whiskey, uh, and we have a lot of uh, single barrels at Corona Cigar. So uh, this is called a Glencairn tasting glass. It's, it's special shape, the way it's like a flute, so that when you nose the whiskey, the flavors are concentrated, and you can really smell that whiskey. So we had these uh, Glencairn glasses uh, etched with the Corona Cigar Company, our single barrel selection on it. So we do a lot of whiskey packs. You know, a lot of times we have the distillers uh, along with cigar makers. We do these special, uh, uh, let's call them tasting packs, which include the whiskey and the cigars. And uh, we, we do have the glasses that are available by themselves, which uh, I think these are $29.95 for the two which is a, a great price because when Glenn Karen's first came out, these things were over hundred dollars for a set because mm. so, they were developed in Scotland and uh, just a really nice gift. So if you go on, on coronascar.com, we've got a lot of, a lot of different whiskey setups. Um, I wanted to highlight another one that I think is really cool. This story here, this was one of the, the, oh man, probably one of the most memorable and admirable guys that I had on for one of the shows we did. This is Horse Soldier Bourbon. And Horse Soldier is about the 12 guys. There's a movie called 12 Strong. And these were the first guys that went into Afghanistan to take out the Taliban after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack. And these guys, uh, when they got into Afghanistan, they were going through terrain that nothing could get through unless you go through on horseback. So these 12 uh, Green Berets literally had to ride cavalry style uh, through the mountains of Afghanistan and engage the Taliban. Now, um, when a lot of these veterans come home, uh, sometimes they have a hard time adjusting back to civilian life. And I love the story of Horse Soldier, where it's a group of uh, veterans, combat veterans, Green Beret veterans that... Uh, started this distillery. They're based out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, Horse Soldier is uh, it's an incredible, this is a 13 year old bourbon. And this is our single barrel pick. It's very rare to get a single barrel from Horse Soldier. So on any of our single barrel picks, they'll always say on the bottom or somewhere on the bottle denoting it's a, it's a Corona Cigar exclusive. So when we taste whiskeys, we taste them to pair with a cigar. We wanna make sure the flavors complement cigars so whenever you go to any of our bars uh, and you order any, we probably, I think we're up to 40 different single barrel picks uh, between bourbon. Uh, we have some cognac single barrel picks. We have uh, some tequilas that are single barrel picks and they're all designed to pair it with cigars. So um, we do have a lot of our, of our packages where it comes with a barrel pick. And this one here, it comes with the American cigar. And we thought that was very appropriate. Uh, the American cigar is made at the JC Newman factory in Tampa. You can see here, this is 100% American tobaccos. Yeah, and it's got the wrapper from our farm in Florida. So this is the only cigar that has a uh, wrapper from Florida. Wonderful. It's a full-bodied cigar. 
real slow smoking cigar too, because we've got uh, Pennsylvania and Connecticut broadleaf in the filler, FSG on the wrapper. And uh, there's a nice package where you get these three cigars. Plus, I like to show this one here. This is called our farm roll. So this is the Florida Sun Grown Farm Roll. This cigar is used nothing but tobacco that comes straight from our farm that's been aged in our bourbon barrels. They've had no fermentation. It's just farm cured and farm rolled. And mm. that's our farm rolls. And these things are incredible. So wow. we, uh, in the past, we hadn't, didn't have a band on them. But we had people that are asking for us to put a band on it. So then when it's in their humidor, they can identify it a little easier. But man, when you smell this cigar, the reason I smile when I smell it, it smells just like our curing barn. When you walk <laughs> into our curing barn, it's tobacco. Where it's hanging inside on the farm. All right. That's what you smell of the aroma when you walk in. So I think that's one of the coolest cigars that's um, totally unique. And, uh, again, we have a lot of these whiskey packs online. And then, finally, I don't have any of these to sell, but I wanted to show it because we sold out of them. But we are taking orders for the next round. <clears throat> you guys know of Daniel Marshall out of California. He's a, he's a friend, and he's a craftsman, and he's just amazing the work that he does on humidors. So Daniel Marshall, he had made special humidors for Balvini Scotch, mm. where he went to Scotland, and he picked out certain barrels from the Balvini distillery, and he shipped them back to California, and he made these humidors out of them. Now, I do have – we have one of those humidors – for sale but it's a it's made out of the staves of the balvini whiskey barrels so when i saw those i was talking to daniel i said daniel how cool would it be if we took the tobacco staves or you can call them sticks you can call them lathes but the sticks and lathes that we actually hang the tobacco on in a barn and make a humidor out of he goes he goes jeff i love it he goes send me the wood and i'll make the humidor so i don't know if i can pick this up for you to see it but this is this was prototype unit number one, and this is uh, all made from the staves or lathes, whichever you want to call them. But this these are the what we hang the tobacco in, and this wood uh, is at least anywhere between fifty to hundred years old, because these these uh, we bought all these staves from Connecticut where they used to hang the tobacco to make Connecticut shade. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's no Connecticut shade growing around there anymore. Um, you know, they're only growing broadleaf, but, but this humidor, check this out when I open it up, it comes with the cigars, oh, Daniel wow. Marshall signs them. They're amazing. So, uh, we're sold out of this, but, uh, Daniel's making it. We only made 10 and, uh, next year we'll make another 10. But anyway, if you want to, if you want to get on the waiting list or, 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 or whatever, um, I think this is the most unique humidor in the business. I just, it's, it, the wood tells a story. It's something that, uh, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's just so authentic, so it's raw. It's definitely and, something. And I love what he did. It's definitely cool and it's very unique. And I, I like how it, I like, oh yeah. Yeah. We put it up, we put it on the cover of the catalog, but we, we only had nine. So they sold out before they, right when it hit the homes, but we're going to, uh, like I said, I talked to Daniel. I said, make another 10 for 2021, and he's he's going to work on it now. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I like the story behind that. I like the idea. Uh, I like how the implementation of a, of a tobacco would versus, like, like, the barrels is definitely a cool idea, but I like how you took that to, like, well, let's – if we if we kept it all tobacco and we took the wood from the curing barn and we made a humidor, that's really unique. I don't think I have. Yeah, I don't. And I'm surprised someone else hasn't thought of that. You know, what's cool about it is that Daniel made a video while he was doing these two. Mm. Um, he is a he's a total craftsman. And, you know, we talked about tradesmen and guys that know how to make things. I love the fact that Daniel knows how to make stuff like this. And he did this. And yeah. And it's all, it's like documented where he's videoing it as he's doing this stuff versus, you know, most of the humidors we get, I'm telling you, they come out of China. And uh, it's unfortunate that we, you know, we don't have a lot of that kind of stuff in America anymore. But this, this is 100 percent 
not only made in America, it's made in California, <laughs> of all places <laughs> where, you know, it's like one of the most expensive states in the world. Uh, but anyway, it's it's Daniel did a great job. And if you ever get him a chance, you should have him on your show. He's quite a, he's so interesting. And his Absolutely. story is his story is really cool. Uh, it, you know, and he's he's this guy is connected with all the celebrities and the and the Arnold Schwarzenegger and all that stuff. So he's a he's he's definitely um, he's a super interesting guy. So anyway, that's my favorite, favorite gift. And then last but not least, for the guy that has everything and money's no object. When we say if you're going to get like Elon Musk a cigar, if Elon Musk is going to hand people out cigars, <laughs> this is the Davidoff Oro Blanco. The most expensive cigar we sell. All right. And I'm going to flip it over and you can see what the price is. It's a little blurred out. Yeah. Hold on. I'll read it to you. It's $500. <laughs> oh, I think Carney cigar. told us about that cigar. I, I think he said he had one one time. It's the Davidoff or yeah. Blanco. It was okay. a Davidoff. Yeah, yeah. That's a $500 cigar. Actually, so I think the, he had it at your place. He probably did. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if you want to, if you, if the, if the money is no object, get a box of Davidoff Oro Blancos. Heck, you get ten of them for what? Five grand. So yeah, there anyway, you go. <laughs> there you go. So that's uh, that's our little treat there. Um, I have smoked an Oro Blanco before. Hanky Kellner gave me one. Actually, I've smoked two of them. Hanky Kellner gave me one, and one time when we uh won the Davidoff Golden Band Awards. Uh, Jim Young gave me one as well. And so, yeah, I've burned through $1,000 worth, worth of cigars on two cigars. But, uh, yeah, it's an incredible smoke, slow burner, really complex flavor, and you can taste the tobacco is really, really old. It's got really well-aged, flavorful tobacco. So uh, that's a cool one, too. So um, yeah. there's we got stores, you know, the packed full of other gifts and items, but... I thought this would be a cool little selection there. Um, everything's available at coronacigar.com. We can ship anywhere, but um, you can go to any of our stores and pick all this stuff up too. That's definitely an awesome lineup. I really liked that. You, uh, A lot of unique stuff too, like stuff that most shops wouldn't even have too. Like the Oros are not something that you, you normally see around a lot of places. That humidor was amazing. I like that. Um, but, but I like how you also, you know, you thought of everyone too. You know, you started entry and then you worked your way up to the real fancy stuff. Yeah, it's cool. You know, some people would just kind of pick like either like all the, the like the rare, fancy, expensive stuff, or like they'll just do like all like the the basic stuff. I like how you thought of everyone. That was really that was a cool presentation. Yeah. So thank you. So we 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 and believe it or not, there's there's tons of other gifts that we have that are that are value priced. I mean, we know that uh, you know it just depends on what people are looking to give. Heck, I don't want to give everybody a five hundred dollar cigar, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yes. So the one thing about uh, Christmas time, there's a lot of cool different gifts to get. Whether in 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 it's a lot of people ask, wait, what do I get? I don't smoke cigars. You know, it just depends on kind of what you want to get the guy. But there's so many great cigars out there too. I could go on for hours and hours and hours. And uh, yeah, it's this interesting horse too. Looking good too. It's interesting <laughs> too because even when you talk about like the rare limited stuff. I mean, we're we're big bourbon people, Nicole and myself. Um, we have quite the collection, and uh, you know, as well as cigars. But it's funny, like it's always the holiday time when all of that crazy stuff comes out. Like that's when the like the antique collection comes out from yeah. Buffalo Trace, and the Pappy Van Winkles come out, and all of a sudden you'll you'll see an influx of like all of the, you know, the the more harder to get cigars from manufacturers like, that they ship it out in the holidays. So it's it's kind of a like it's the holidays and you're buying gifts for people but then also it's like that's the most expensive time of the year for yourself too because you want to you want to get stuff and that's the only time it comes out <laughs> well we've done too if you look at uh, on coronacigar.com uh, there's a section where we did all the packages yeah we've got some really interesting packages where we've paired cigars with whiskey and there's a lot of different ones um that are available that you can't find those whiskeys in, in, in the market in a lot of places. But also remember that when we do a Blanton's or if we do a Buffalo Trace or, or whether it's the Maker's Mark or, or Knob Creek, Russell's, whatever. We, like I said, we had over 40 of these things or Patron, Tequila, any of this stuff. They're unique. The ones we have, there you go, Russell's Reserve. Great the ones bottle. that we have, 
are not the same stuff that you'll buy in the store because all we buy the barrel. So there's right. our single barrel selections are unique to us. And also when we talk to the distillers, there's a flavor profile that we're looking for. Um, and you know what? We had a really – one of the, the newer uh, single barrels that we got last year that I was super surprised. There's a Jack Daniels single barrel barrel strength, okay? Now, we've been doing Jack Daniels single barrels for 12 years. The barrel strength, I'm telling you, this blew me away. It was on a whole nother level. This was such good whiskey. And, you know, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it was when we, we went up there to the distillery, and, and I really think they cherry picked some of the finest stuff because there's a flavor profile we tell them ahead of time when we go there. So, this is what we're looking for. We want medium wood, we want high on the caramel, medium spice, uh, high on the vanillas. And, you know, when you, when you tell them ahead of time, they're going to start pulling barrels that fit that flavor profile. And you can give them other flavor flavor profiles. You could say, I want all wood and spice or whatever. We like, we just, I, there's a, there's a certain, what I like to call our little magic recipe that we know pairs best with cigars. So when they pull these things, we, we really, and we've been working with these guys for a long time. So they know uh, what we're looking for. And it's in, and, and, and they really do pull some, I, I say they really cherry pick their own single barrels. And so when you buy the whiskeys that we have in the packages, this is not going to be like any other, uh, uh, whiskey that you buy in your liquor store because it's a different flavor profile. So, right. so we've been we've been blessed with that program, um, you know. But but we were one of the early adapters when the very first single. You know what our f- first single barrel bourbon was? Four Roses. Really, uh, Nicole's a big fan of the Four Roses. Actually, yeah, yeah. that stuff got hard to get recently too. So, um, but Four Roses theirs was interesting because not only did you pick the barrels, you pick the mash bill and you pick the yeast. So you, we directed them. So there's, so really on our single barrel, it's not even the same mash bill in the same yeast that's used in the single barrels of, of uh, four roses. So yeah, it's, we got some really interesting and unique stuff. Let me ask you an interesting question. Cause I don't know if many people would think to even ask this question. Um, but you know, we're always looking out for bourbon. We're always looking for bottles of certain things we like where uh, most of our palate is in the Buffalo trace distillery. Um, but that's not to say we don't drink other stuff. I mean, like I said, the Russell's reserve from wild Turkey, is fantastic. We, we actually, we got this from one of our local stores. Uh, it's a single barrel privately. You know, I, I think I talked to him like a week later. I'm like, Oh, this bottle is great. I got to go have another one. Yeah. He's like, yeah, they're, they're already gone. I'm like, yeah. it's fantastic. Um, but it's an interesting question. I noticed, you know, a lot of, people when they when they're grabbing bottles because obviously you know, we belong to a lot of the groups online and stuff people will grab store picks um and it's funny to see people say like oh well is that is that barrel a non-chill filtered barrel because from what i understand some distilleries in certain in certain lines some of the barrels will be chill filtered and some of them won't be Correct. um yeah, and I and I was curious as to what you, what your kind of um, mentality is on it, and wh- where you tend to go with that well, when you pick your barrels. It, 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 no, what we do is if their particular one, like say Four Roses, there's are chill filtered, some that aren't. If their standard line is chill filtered, meaning their single barrel, if if you buy a single barrel of their own of uh, let's say whether it's Russell's or, or Knob or whatever. We still want it to be either chill filtered or not based on what their line is because we don't want to vary that much. As a matter of fact, I don't think they will. They don't even offer it that way. Mm. So, for example, if, if Russell's is chill filtered, they're not going to say, hey, do you want it chill filtered or not? They're not going to do that because they don't want it to fall so far out of the out of their portfolio or, or they don't want it to fall so far out of the flavor profile of what that whiskey is supposed to be. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah, no, I so, do. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, they don't offer that that option for you. Um, as far as Buffalo Trace Distillery goes, we started doing uh, single barrels with them early as well. You know, we have an Elmer T. Lee single barrel that we did right before Elmer T. Lee passed away, and mm. then after that we couldn't get them anymore. Um, but I think in the future they may do that again. But we get Blantons as well. We get several barrels of Blantons that we do every year. Eagle Rare. Uh, quite a few Buffalo Trace. So um, for us, they've been a good company because, um, you know, we, we were with them 
before the bourbon craze and they mm-hmm. haven't forgot us afterwards, which is important. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I like that because sometimes companies, you know, they blow up and then they forget about guys that used to buy their stuff and no one knew what they were. Right. So, uh, but, but yeah, Zazarek's been good. And, uh, and, and it's amazing how popular their whiskeys are because I didn't, I mean, I didn't expect Blanton's to turn into the, the, the unicorn that it's kind of gotten sometimes people are like, yeah, Blanton's got Blanton's. Yeah. yeah it's but- funny. Like, it's so funny too, that you say that. Cause like, I keep a few bottles of Blanton's on hand. Uh, I think it's a good bourbon. We drink it. Nicole likes it. I like it. It's, it's, it's a good bourbon. Do I think that it's, do I think that it's as crazy as some people make it out to be? No. No, I don't no. think so. It, it, because it's it's good, but the same people that are saying Blanton's is the holy grail, it's like, well, they may never even had Eagle Rare. They never, may never had, you know, Elmer T. Lee or Buffalo Trace or whatever. So, you know, all the bourbons that are coming out of Zazarek are good, out of the Buffalo Trace distillery. It's right. just that some are a little different than others. Um, Pappy's the one that we... Before Pappy got popular, we used to have that as much as we wanted. And I mean, we we're actually running. I remember when they presented it to us, I said, man, I think that'll sell. No one ever heard of it. And uh, I, I said, I think it'll sell because the guy's got a cigar who's on the, on the label. And so I knew that would work. But then a few years later, it turned into the monster it has. And, and plus, I liked it, too, because it was one of the only ones that had a 23 in, in 21 and different age statements where most bourbons that they didn't really put age statements on the bottles. Most of it mm. were eight years old at the oldest. But then they started to realize, because we, we always sell a lot of single malt scotch. And mm-hmm. as you know, a single malt, the, the older it gets, the more expensive it gets. Right. And so um, Pappy was kind of the first to really have that old bourbon uh, age statement. So anyway, it's a, we love bourbon. We love brown spirits. And uh, and I love the single barrel programs we do. We, we obviously invest a ton of money in it because, you know, when you buy barrels at a time, it's a pretty big pretty big chunk but um you know when you when you come to that's what makes corona special when you order a buffalo trace or any type of uh, bourbon at corona cigar it's not the same stuff off the shelf that you're going to pick with the liquor store yeah no that's cool and, and anyone who you know as much as this is a cigar show and you know we, we always talk about bourbon and, and other spirits on the show too um but you know we do like to get into it it's something nicole and i really enjoy uh this is a great conversation having with you someone who's also knowledgeable on the on the on the subject but yeah i mean if you are if you're in the area or if you're if you're traveling you're going to corona and you are a whiskey drinker and you and you do smoke but even if you don't smoke and you just want to go to that's definitely you know a place to go check you know like you said you know you have different stuff it's not going to be the same and and someone like me would be like oh that i'm even more apt to like want to go just to sample your whiskey selection to get taste get the the flavor profile and, and taste them and just and just kind of see that because i'm into that stuff i'm like the you know like the cigar geek but i'm also like you know the bourbon geek like i actually you know I, last night i watched a whole video on cooperage and oh, that's all the, amazing i love that i watched that yeah. whole video yeah so the first time i went to a cooperage it was in scotland where they were actually doing the repairs it was over at the glen Fittick distillery behind it there's a there's a cooperage there and that's up in the in the space side area of scotland and they 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 repair barrels there and, and rebuild them and stuff because most of the barrels are coming in from France and America. Um, but watching these guys disassemble and reassemble a barrel, man, you talk about well, we talk about skilled trade, right? When when you know when you're a skilled tradesman, you recognize someone that's got skills, right? Right. And so you see these guys, man, these guys were putting these barrels together and throwing these staves down like. It's just, it was amazing to watch them work and how fast they were and the way they would fix them. And then I was fortunate enough to go to a cooperage in, uh, uh, that Brown Foreman has in, uh, right outside Louisville, man, that place was amazing. They don't do a lot of tours there at all because they, there's a lot of, uh, proprietary, it's an assembly line, you know, and there's a lot of people don't like showing all the tricks of how they do this kind of stuff, but watching mm. that, man, it was amazing. It was amazing watching these guys make barrel so yeah it's a it's it's people have no idea how much work goes into making a barrel and the skill that's involved especially if you're a guy that fixes them because at the end there's there's like six guys that if there's a problem with the barrel right they'll disassemble it figure it out and, and you know sometimes there can be a stave that just has just doesn't meet perfectly right and it's going to leak and remember you you don't want to have a leaking barrel after you filled it up with with bourbon 
You know, that right. can cost yeah. you a ton of money, right? So when they make these things, imagine trying to make, you know, it's not like it's plastic container. This is wooden staves that have to really be perfect, right? You know, so uh, so watching these guys work and, and, and the speed at what they do, it, it's, it was, if you get a chance to visit a cooperage, please do it because it's amazing. It's so funny. The video I watched last night, I don't remember the name of the company who uh, was featured. I have it on Facebook somewhere. I'll have to find it. But it was funny listening to the, to the guy talk about how we started. And he was like, so I actually had to go to a cooperage in California to learn how to make it. Oh, for the wine guys, yeah. And he said, and the guy told me, like, if you were from around here, I would not have done that because you're yeah. a competition for me. And they, yeah. they take it so seriously. Like a guy, so I think he's in New York. And he, and he was like, yeah, he's, I, don't, I think they were the first one in New York. And he was like, yeah, but anyone around here, like, they wouldn't want to show me how to make a barrel. Because the, so I had to go outside of my market zone to learn how to make barrels because only because, like, I'm not really a threat to that guy over there. You know what I mean? So it, it's, yeah. it's hard. You know, you have to I guess it's, it's a little bit harder to learn, too, because you got to find someone who's willing to show you the craft. Well, in, in the, the brown foreman one, there's a lot of stuff, too, that were like you weren't allowed to take pictures or video because there was obviously a lot of uh, uh, proprietary information there that they didn't want out. But anyway, it was it's really cool to watch. So good, good place to visit if you get the chance. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, really quick, I do want to hit on our sports segment um, brought to you by Nova Cigars, uh, Platinum Nova, make Nova big. Um, we mostly been talking about football on the show. Uh, it's usually myself and John and John will go on his full, uh, summary of the NFL as a whole. Um, and just his thoughts on who, who's doing what and who's this. I don't have John with me to, to be my main sports guy. So I have to, uh, I have to kind of pieces, pieces together myself. Um, but if we're looking at football, um, the Patriots as our team, and so that's not only who we talk about, but uh, I'm assuming you're a football guy. Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. Somewhat. I'm surprised. Okay. Okay. I thought you. I so, pictured you as being like a real football guy. No. I, <laughs> like, listen, I went to a game not too long, two weeks ago, I think, or three weeks ago. I went to see the Jacksonville Jaguars. They were playing the uh, Cleveland Browns, and oh. the Browns beat them. But it was a good game. I know Jacksonville's horrible right now, but that was a great game. And then. Uh, you know, I used to be able to go to the Bucks games with the Newmans, and so we watch a lot of the Bucks football. But uh, what, all I can tell you about football right now, what bad timing, man. Good God. Tampa's got the Super Bowl. You know, we have a store. It's literally our, our Davidoff Tampa store. Is, you can walk to the stadium from it. So yeah. uh, it's it's in, in Tampa. You know, they had the Lightning with the Stanley Cup and and uh, the Rays with the World Series. We got Jip here with COVID, man. There was, you know, no fans to see anything. So yeah. it's going to be, and with Tom Brady too, I mean, come on, man. It's like, talk about a real, uh, uh, you know, everything would have been so great if we could add fans this year. But uh, I would say Tampa probably got, took the biggest hit in professional sports when it comes to the shutdowns from COVID. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing too, Tom Brady, we finally let someone else have Tom Brady and, uh, no matter where he went, still like the first year, you can't really go and do anything, go to games and on all that stuff because no one, no one can go anywhere. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right, Tampa. That's that's one of those cities too. That's that's a fun city, and to not even be able to really enjoy festivities and it sucks. It really so does. So what's the what's the vibe in about Tom Brady up in the New England area? <sighs> to be honest do you with feel you, like he dis- do you feel like he uh, deserted you or? or- I think that it depends on who you ask. Most people kind of feel like I don't if most people I know don't hate on Tom. They're still Tom fans. In fact, I can't Good. tell you how many people up here were buying uh, the Brady Bucks jerseys as soon as they hit the market. And it was all like wow. the beginning of the week one. It was like, I'm going to watch the Bucks game. And it's like, what about the Patriots? Yeah, we'll, we'll check it out. And it's like, what? <laughs> That was well, like the good. biggest response. Good. Even John was all like, "Oh yeah, like we got to watch both games and blah blah." blah. Um, I don't know. I thought he said he wanted to get a Brady Bucks jersey. I don't know if he did, but I thought I thought he said that. But uh, I'll have to verify. But yeah, so do, I mean, do you, you guys, guys think that Brady's gonna like? This hasn't been a great season. Um, do you think uh, he's washed up, or do you think he's gonna come back and 
you know, be on top again. At first, I was just really skeptical because it was going to be such a different environment for him. Um, I think that he... I think it was an interesting choice to believe when he did. Because he, as good as he is, he he's not as good as he used to be. He's definitely not in his prime. But he's still a very good quarterback. But at this late in the game, so to speak, let's say I mean, he only has a couple years left, right? With your last few years, you go to a new team new area, new organization. You spent the majority of your very successful career in one spot with one team and all of that. And then you just, you start from scratch towards the end. I think his first season is definitely like an adjustment period. I think that he's in a new element and he's got to get kind of on the same page and kind of get things going. I would say I would really be interested to see where he goes next year after he's had the first year in Tampa to kind of, just kind of get things going um, and then to see how he does now that he, all right, now let's go to year two. Uh, and he has a little bit more of experience with Tampa now that he's been outside of new England for a season. I'd be curious to see how he does next year. I think that they did okay this year. There's a couple of things that he did that were a little questionable. Some mistakes he made or just some of the games they played. Uh, it was a, a few weeks ago. I think they got blown out, but I don't even remember who that was. Um, and they lost a game and I was a little I was like, huh, that's interesting. But still, I mean, they're – let me pull up the standings. I have the standings in front of me. They are – where are they? So you know what I think is – They're 8-5. What's interesting that we haven't seen is imagine if – what the real question is for the Bucks is if we didn't have COVID and people could go to the games, would Tom Brady be selling out the Bucks every game? That's the big question. I think he would because there's – there's obviously going to be an influx of fans who want to see Tom Brady play. And up here in New England, getting tickets to a Patriots game. I mean, Patriots games are completely sold out before right. the season even starts. Now he goes to a new market where um, I don't think that the Bucks are exactly in the same boat. So mm -hmm. now it's like it's way more available for someone to go and watch Tom Brady play. And I really felt like, this year, you know, aside from all that stuff, if it was a normal scenario, I think, yeah, I think people would have been like, oh, we got to go see Tom Brady play. And now he's yeah, on our team. That, that would have been the biggest thing is whether it was was Tom Brady a good pickup for the Bucks. At the end of the day, if he fills the stadium every game, the answer is yes, mm -hmm. whether they win a Super Bowl or not. But the thing is that it's kind of been unfair that we'll not, we have no idea. Is whether or not would it would it translate into sold out games? Because that's what the Bucks need. Um, there's still a lot of support for the Bucks. The, the city of Tampa actually supports his teams very well, but right. they they don't they're not selling out the stadium. Well, it's it's interesting too because I think that when Tom hit the market, I think that as much as people know about his reputation and his his resume being like, well, it's very impressive. Anyone would want to grab him. But I think a lot of the things, I think the first thing that came into everyone's mind before like, oh, we're going to get Tom Brady. Like we're going to win a Super Bowl. It was, I think the first thing was we're going to get Tom Brady. And that's going to bring money in because yeah. regardless if he goes to a Super Bowl or not, people are going to want to spend money to come to the games because they're like, oh, we got to come see Tom Brady. And that brings in business for them. And I think that that's kind of the business in, in any professional sport. When you have those star players uh, and they get, to free agency and they do decide to leave and they're not a franchise player that team who scoops them the first thing they think about is oh yeah we'll give him that that big thing that he's looking for that big contract because you know what the play there is oh now everyone's gonna gonna come spend money at the game spend fifteen dollars on a beer and fifty dollars on parking and two hundred dollars on a ticket and all the other stuff that comes with it. And, you know, just to cover I'm the laughing, game. I'm laughing because Florida <laughs> prices for parking is not 50 bucks. So we're 20 oh, and 10. Jesus. Wow. Yeah, 20 it's and expensive 10. up here. <laughs> yeah. So we save the $50 for $500 cigars, whatever you can, whatever you save in parking. But, uh, Florida is definitely a different world. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, fortunately it, it, yeah, we don't get hit for that kind of the tickets are the ticket price, but uh, and also listen, the Buck Stadium is amazing. It's it's really is Raymond James Stadium is, is a really nice stadium. So anyway, yeah. back to your back to your uh, sports news. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's really all I had. Uh, just I, like I said, we we kind of just do like a weekend review for football. Uh, Julian Edelman 
came back to the practice squad today for the Patriots. He's been out since I want to say like middle of October. Um, there wasn't there was there was comments made and some questions on whether he'd actually come back before the end of the season, but he has made it back to the practice squad, so that's encouraging. Um, Julian Edelman, he's a tough guy. I mean, he's a small guy, but he's he's been in a lot of big games. He's played a lot of good football. He's been around for a while. And he's tough. Um, he can, he can take some hits. Uh, and he's so who's places. gonna who's gonna win the Super Bowl? Oh, we've had this conversation. Um, All right. Each week, as it progresses, it's it should be easier for you to predict. For me, I'd love to see. I don't. I don't. I obviously don't see the Patriots going this year, uh, and I can't complain because we've been so thankful. But one of the first things we talked about last week that was wild is John was like, it would be cool to see someone from the NFC East win the Super Bowl because no matter who goes to the playoffs, it's going to be a team with a losing record. <laughs> and to see a team win with a losing record would be hilarious uh, and pretty impressive. I'd like to see the Saints win. Um, I do like the Saints. I like Drew Brees. I know that Drew's also getting up there in age. I'd love to see him walk away with more than one Super Bowl title. I think he's a great quarterback. Um, I think that he's come so close in the last few years. And like, was it last year where they? I I, I feel they got robbed on that pass interference call that they had, um, and they and they lost that NFC game. I, and I mean they're ten and three right now. They're, they're they're looking good. I'd love to see them win. Outside of them, don't be surprised if the Buffalo Bills come out of nowhere and win this. I think that the Bills definitely have the skill and the momentum to win a Super Bowl. Um, I know a lot of people are looking at the Steelers, who were undefeated until the last two weeks. Now they they're on a two week they're on a two week losing skid. And it'll be interesting to see if maybe they lose their momentum now going into the end of the season into the playoffs, if they've lost that momentum that they've had all season long. Um, they were a contender for me, I'm starting to kind of question a few things. Um, and then, of course, there's the Chiefs, the reigning champ. They're 12 and one. Patrick Mahomes is a great quarterback. Um, I've said it before. I like I like Mahomes. He's a younger guy. He, he I think he's going places, especially, you know, in football, if they stay healthy, that's the biggest thing. If they stay healthy and they keep playing well, you know, the sky is the limit. Um, I don't know. It, it's tough to pick. There's, there's a couple of good teams, um, but I'm, I'm putting my money on the Saints. I, I want to see I want to see the Saints win. I want to see an, NFT, an, uh, an NFC team win. That's who that's who I'm I'm putting my my uh, my hands down on is the Saints. But uh, Chiefs look good. I think the Bills have a, a good shot. Um, Steelers, again, they've played well so far, but I'm curious to see how they end the season out after this. All right, we got your pick. Yeah, that's that's who I'm going with. Uh, normally I'd have John to to go back and forth with. Uh, I, I remember it was like a few weeks ago I asked that question, and, he, and I think he predicted – I forget who the AFC team was, but he predicted uh, – might have been Steelers. I thought he said maybe Steelers, um, Seahawks, Super Bowl. Um, I don't know if I see that happening now, but I remember he. I remember he threw out the Seahawks a few weeks ago. Um, I don't see that now. I'm. I'm going with. I'm going with Saints. I'm going with Saints. All right, Matt. I've got to open a door real quick. Hang on. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go mute for a sec. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, I couldn't yeah. help you with the sports there. <laughs> no, that's okay. Like I said, it, it's really just turned into the football segment as of lately, uh, just because of the way the sports are right now and what happened with the season um, because of COVID. Like, there's no hockey, there's no basketball right now. So it's just really turned into the football section. Um, only for a few more weeks, hopefully, um, as you know, basketball and hockey should be starting up again. And then we'll actually have some, some other things to talk about. Um, no soap review this week. It's, I spoke to John briefly last week. There was I know he's doing his LFD event tonight down in, um, I think he's down in Florida. And uh, he had mentioned that he was going to try to make an appearance on the show, maybe do a, another spontaneous soap review from the bathroom like he did at Atlanta Cigar Week. If you guys uh, saw that episode a few months ago, that was a definitely, definitely, Jeff, if you haven't seen that, you got to at least just, Go watch the, the soap segment of that episode where John, he was at Atlanta Cigar Week, and he was on his phone, 
and he was dialed into the into the show and he went into the bathroom and they had a, a bathroom attendant and he had like the bathroom attendant in there with him and the guy's like handing him cigarettes and stuff and doing the soap review with him and like wanted to be on camera it was hilarious it was a guy pissing in the urinal in the background we got that all on we got it all on film it's on the youtube channel you can find it it was hilarious i'll look it up <laughs> i'll look it up <laughs> Uh, All right, so we're we've got an event downstairs that I've got to be to finish up. At, I'm actually oh, still yeah. working tonight. Yeah, no, so, we're uh, we're just about ready to wrap up anyway. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll end it here. Um, other than that, it is the smoking tobacco Christmas party week. We have some stuff we're gonna talk about. We have a giveaway to announce. All that fun stuff. We have two more shows this week. We got Gerard from Mardo Cigar on Friday night, and we have Jose Blanco from Arturo Fuente on Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Same place, Facebook Live. Um, Jeff, thank you for coming on the show. I know you're a busy guy. Appreciate it. Thank Anything you. Anything I want to say before we before we close up? I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Tonight we actually have a McAllen event going down downstairs. So Ooh. pairing up some Davidoff FSG with McAllen. So, uh, yeah, we do both virtual and in person. So thank goodness uh, we're still allowed to do that here in Florida. And so hopefully uh, – Everybody up north and in any of these other states, uh, hopefully things will get back uh, get back soon. Yeah. Well, that sounds like awesome, an awesome time. Um, I'd love to come down and check out some of your events too. At some point, uh, I've heard very good things. You guys, you guys have a great time down there, at Corona. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Um, when you, you guys- come down, make sure you hit me up, and and we'll uh, crack up some of that great bourbon that we've got. Uh, some of those single barrel selections from your favorite distillery. Buffalo yeah, Trace. I, I, I'd, I'd love to. I, yeah, I will. I'll be in touch with you. And I'd, I'd love to do uh, do some whiskey stuff with you down there, too. So that would be fun. But, uh, yeah, so that's going to do it for us, guys. Uh, Nicole, as always, thank you for coming on uh, when <laughs> you can. Um, and no John this week. Hopefully we hear from him on. I, he should be here Friday and Saturday. Um, but other than that, we'll see you Friday night. See you guys. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank-